So Jesus was a perfect example of what it means to be focused. And so he is a perfect picture of living a life of significance. And so Luke chapter 4, verse 40 says this, At sunset, the people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sicknesses, and laying his hands on each one, he healed them. Moreover, demons came out of many people, shouting, You are the Son of God. But he rebuked them and not allowed them to speak because they knew he was the Messiah. At daybreak, Jesus went out to a solitary place, and the people were looking for him. When they came to where he was, they tried to convince him to stay there, not to leave. But he said, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns because that is why I was sent. That was a great meeting. That was a great shot. Do you want me to tell you? I can tell you again about it. I mean, what do you know? It was great. It was awesome. The big flock came in. Decoys worked. I snuck up. Perfect setup. Made the great shot. The decoy sank. I mean, I can tell you all about it, right? Jesus was having a pretty good meeting. Demons were squealing. Cripples were getting up and walking home. And so, of course, they did not want him to leave, right? But what gave Jesus his significance? Who he was and why he was sent. Who are you and where are you sent? Who are you? You are not here by accident. God has put you here in this time, in this place. Why are you here and where are you sent? is an answer that you have to give. So here are nine significant indicators that'll help you define distractions and make quality decisions when you leave here. Number one, it said Jesus laid his hands on each one. Now that was not his assignment. It was part of his assignment, but how would he increase his significance by training others how to lay their hands on the sick, right? So he understood the necessity to train others to duplicate what he was doing. So he sent out the 12, then the 72, then he sent the church. And now you're laying your hands on the sick and they recover. Let me ask you this, what are you laying your hands to? What are you laying your hands to? Is what you're putting your hands to increasing your significance? Is it tied to your assignment or are you laying your hands to, as most people do, to just wasting time? Purpose demands urgency. What are you laying your hands to? Number two, who are you? Jesus knew who he was. So what is your uniqueness? You have to answer the question. Who are you? Your uniqueness is what makes you valuable like that little tiny screwdriver. May not be a great screwdriver, but when you need it, it is the most valuable screwdriver you can have at that moment. Number three in our nine steps to stay on track, you need to hear from God. Jesus continued his life of prayer to stay focused on his assignment. In the midst of great success, he still needed to hear from God. It's easy to want to hold on to yesterday's victories, but the enemy adjusts to that. And you need today's strategy. So you need to keep in touch and pray to learn and to stay focused. Number four, Jesus was not moved by people's acclaim. That was not his assignment. He could care less. His objective was to please the Father, to fulfill his assignment. Number five, what are you doing? Jesus said, I must and he knew exactly what he was to be doing. They tried to keep him from leaving that town, and he said, I must, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns. That is why I was sent. Doing great things is no replacement for doing significant things. What should you be doing to have significance, great results? Now, here's, this is a major one, number six. This is a huge one that needs to be starred under, on your wall or someplace. Where should you be doing it? What is your territory? Where's your niche? He said the other towns of Judah. Okay, listen, here's the sentence. Write this one down. Jesus could judge his progress because he knew where he was going. When you don't know where you're going, you have no way to judge time. 
Jesus could judge his progress because he knew where he was going, where he was supposed to be and what he was supposed to be doing. Jesus said, that, number seven, that was the reason I was sent. What is your reason, your cause, your crusade? Money is not a crusade. Because if it is, the minute you have some, you stop. Most people have a survival mentality. They work to stop, not work to go. Your future must be bigger than your today. Tell me your plan. Where are you going and how fast do you want to get there? The Transcontinental Railroad came into existence in the 1800s, radically transformed life in the United States. Instead of four months to go to California, from New York to California, you could do it in four, in four weeks by train. Now today you can do it by car about 43 hours, by jet four or five hours, right? But yet today, 60% of Americans in one year don't fly at all. They're content to drive or ride their bicycle or walk. Maybe they don't have an urgent assignment that demands them to be places. But the bottom line is, maybe they don't even entertain the idea. You know, taking a 1,400 mile family trip's nice unless you have to be there tomorrow. <laughs> right? So what happens? You turn down the trip. You turn down the assignment because you can't see how it fits. No, you need to change how you fit into the assignment, right? So tell me your plan. Monday morning is coming quickly. When you head home, tell me with clarity what you are going to do. I've trained salesmen for all my life. And salesmen are positive people, but sometimes they're what do I want to say? I don't want to use the word ignorant. They don't look at the facts. They, they assume, that's what I want to say. They assume Monday's going to be great. It's going to be great. We're going to be number one. It's going to be awesome. Great. Show me your planner. Show me your appointments. I'm, I'm hoping to get some Monday. I had a guy work for me like that. Man, he was positive, Mr. Positive. Man, it's going to be awesome. It's going to be fantastic. And he'd have his pencil and paper and he'd be drawing diagrams and his plans would be awesome. And he's going bankrupt. In Tulsa, when I was moving here, God said, move to Ohio. He came to my office, closed the door, sat down and said, now, Gary, you know, I've paid an awesome price here. Oh, I knew the price he paid. His wife was in tears, barely could buy groceries the whole time he worked for me, sit in his office, wouldn't make calls, wouldn't see the clients, always, it's gonna be great, it's gonna be awesome, but he never did it. And so I looked at him, I believe it was the Holy Spirit. I said, you know, you did pay an awesome price. One, you didn't have to pay. You could have paid the price of doing what makes money. You could have done the price of winning instead of losing. That was your choice, but you paid an awesome price. <laughs> I said, but you just paid the wrong price. You paid the wrong price. It's interesting, after we left Tulsa, um, well, actually, before we left Tulsa, this guy, another guy in my office, stood up in the middle of our sales meetings and said, Gary, you'll never be successful in sales. You'll never be able to train anyone to be successful in sales. Of course, I was living full-time on sales. And another guy popped up, yeah, I agree. See, these guys were complainers. I was doing the sales. They could have done what I was doing, right? But they had to have an excuse for their inactivity and their laziness. Yeah, you couldn't, help, you couldn't make us successful. Exactly. So we became number one. Moving here became number one, 5,000 offices, reps all over the country. This guy calls me. The guy that's gonna be great, it's gonna be, he calls me. Hey, I heard you're number one. How, I haven't talked to you in years. How did you hear that? He said, another guy in the office, the other guy stood up, called him and told him. <laughs> yeah, interesting. Do you know you have people right now that hope you fail? Yeah, there's people around you that hope you fail. You don't want to be friends with them. They flatter a lot. 
in the back of their mind, they hope you fail. When I was in college, you heard my story that we had to write a paper in my freshman year. And so I did my best. I got it back, and you know what it said on it from my teacher. It had a big F on the whole page, front page. I mean, not a little F, on the page. <laughs> Under it said, is it possible you went to high school? This is my, I think my 13th or 14th book now. And when my, <laughs> when my uh, first book came out, this guy uh, emailed me. Hey, do you remember me? I'm the professor in English, you know, you had. And is, could this really be the same Gary could see I had in class? <laughs> A friend of mine came into our office here in New Albany. I was not there. Walked up to my secretary and said, okay, I don't get it. I've known Gary his whole life. He flunked out of high school. I don't get it. How is he on television? I don't, I don't, I don't, what's going on here? I don't, I don't get it. See, I'm trying to say this because they're watching. Your friends, relatives, your enemies, they're all watching. That's why God said, I want to show my greatness through you. Because your greatest revenge is success. <laughs> Your greatest revenge is success. <laughs> and by the way, I like to use the foolish to confound the wise, Gary, just so you know. <laughs> you, you did it, but I did it with you, okay? My dad was finally born again because he was watching. I couldn't talk to my dad about God. It, it got, broke out into a, a strife every time. I mean, for years, I, I can't talk. I said, Lord, you got to send someone else. I can't do it. He will not receive a word I say. But yet he watched our television show. He saw Amy's healing of that 13-pound tumor. And the day he came to church, I can still remember my kids running the aisle. Dad, Grandpa's here. I said, what? Grandpa's here at church? <laughs> sure enough, in the back row, my dad was sitting. During that message, I tried not to look at him, you know, the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> but I could see tears in that back row. I could see tears. After that message, you know, I walked out there. He was talking to some people. Everyone knew dad in this town. And they were talking to him. His back was to me. He didn't see me walk out. I heard him say that. I heard the guy say, now, Tom, why? How, how, you're at church. What happened? And my dad said, I've seen too many things I can't explain. They're watching, friends. They're watching. They're watching. You're supposed to be up on that stage. You're supposed to have the $100,000 bonus check. God wants to use you to confound the wise. He wants to use you to demonstrate his glory and his greatness in your life. But you've got to stop saying no. You've got to stop saying no. No. 